Good morning, Wednesday Chapel. Woo! Happy Wednesday. We invite you to join us in worship this morning if you could stand to your feet.
Yes, God, you're a good father, Lord. You have so many wonderful names, Lord. You're an everlasting father, your master, your savior, your prince of peace, Emmanuel, Yeshua HaMessiah, Jehovah Jireh. We love you, Lord. You have so many wonderful names. We praise you for that, Lord. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Yeah. We're going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. And you would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. Mm, you've never been closer than you are right now. Cause you are a gyra. You are enough. Yeah, if you believe that, sing that out. Sing gyra. See so clear what it's all about. So stay by my side when the sun goes down. Lord. I don't want to forget how I feel right now. Sing Shira. Shira. Oh, you, you are enough. Sing Shira. Shira. You are enough. Just spoken. I'm already loved more than I could imagine, and that is.
You're Jireh, provider. Yeshua HaMessiah, Lord. You're the beginning and the end, Lord. You're the Alpha and Omega. We praise you, God, for all of your wonderful names, Lord. Your counselor, your healer, your friend, and your father, Lord. And we thank you so much for, for playing all those roles in our lives. When we need you, Lord, you, you can be any role that we need you to be, Lord. You are that role when we, when we need it desperately, even if we don't know that we need it, Lord. We just, we thank you so much for that today. And we we praise you for your holy name. In your name, amen. All right, good morning, APU. How are you? Yes, yeah, great to see all of you. Happy New Year to you. <clears throat> Welcome to our, uh, our community chapel. We're so glad to be together. Uh, students, you're joined this morning by our faculty and staff. And uh, it's a wonderful time for us to be together. I hope you enjoyed the donuts this morning. And uh, just as we were finishing up our worship song, I did see a, a guy walk in with a whole box of donuts. And so I'm not sure how, did you see that, Andrew? Yeah, I'm not sure how that worked, but, um, but more power to you. I love it. I love it. This is great. Um, well, hey, one um, little piece of housekeeping before I introduce our um, speaker this morning, and that is that um, all of you should have reached, uh, received from us an email um, that has a climate survey uh, in there. It's about a 15-minute uh, process that you'll go through to answer some questions as we're wanting to do an internal assessment of the, the APU climate. It's for faculty, staff, and students, and uh, this will be super helpful to us on the administrative side as we are um, working together to strengthen the community here at APU that we might really thrive uh, as a Christ-centered university. Well, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce a friend who is also a gifted communicator uh, who has a passion for equipping the church, particularly young people. And uh, his name is Dr. Sean McDowell. And uh, let me just share a few um, words with you about Sean. Um, he does connect with audiences in many, many ways through humor and stories, while imparting hard evidence and logical support for viewing all areas of life through a biblical worldview. Uh, Sean is an associate professor in the Christian Apologetics Program at Talbot School of Theology which is part of Biola University, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. A little ironic that he's here on game day here at APU. Um, he also teaches high school Bible, uh, which helps give him exceptional insights into the prevailing culture so he can impart wisdom to fellow educators and to pastors and to parents alike. Dr. McDowell in 2008 was uh, named Educator of the Year in his hometown of San Juan Capistrano and the Association of Christian Schools International, you might know that as ACSI, awarded exemplary status to his apologetics training. And Sean is listed among the top 100 apologists of our time. He graduated summa cum laude from Talbot with a double master's degree in theology and philosophy and earned his PhD in apologetics and worldview studies from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in 2014, and he has traveled the country, uh, has traveled outside of our country, and he speaks at camps and churches and schools and universities. He's been connected and has spoken at Focus on the Family, the Chuck Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Uh, he's been with Crew, Youth Specialties, Hume Lake. Some of you have spent time in the summer at Hume Lake, connected with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and as I mentioned, the Association of Christian Schools 
International. He's also the co-host of Think Biblically, which is a podcast, one of the more popular or most popular pod podcasts on faith and culture. And his YouTube channel, Dr. Sean McDowell, is one of the top apologetics uh, channels. He's author, co-author, and editor of over 20 books, including So the Next Generation Will Know, and another book familiar to many in this room, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, along with his dad. He has also, uh, or is also, um, a, a leader with an apologetics blog that can be found at seanmcdowell.org. Uh, in April 2000, Sean married his high school sweetheart, Stephanie. As I mentioned, they live in San Juan Capistrano. They have three kids. Uh, their 10-year-old son, Shane, is with us in the front row. Shane, we're glad you're here. <clears throat> and, and let me just say to Shane, even though your dad works at Biola, you are always welcome at Azusa Pacific University. <clears throat> And so the recruiting of Shane actually starts today. Um, and so, yeah, so isn't it interesting, right? Uh, it's game day here, uh, the crosstown rivalry between Biola and APU. We're in, for, uh, yeah, we're in for a real treat. So Sean actually played basketball at Biola from 1994 to 1998. And so I did, of course, go back and do a little research. While Sean played at Biola, Biola's record against APU was one and nine. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, yes, they won one game, we won nine. I just, I just want to say that. And so to um, sort of remind Sean of those years, I have two gifts for him today. Yeah, one, of course, would be an Azusa Pacific University t-shirt, yes. And the other, thank you, Dr. Gary Pine, I actually have a basketball jersey from Azusa Pacific University that I'd actually like to see on you at some point, but that might be pushing it a little bit. So I have these two gifts for him. And let me just say one other thing. So the ga it's game day, right? 5.15, the, the, uh, the women's team plays. I think the men play at 7.30. Um, Dr. Dave Holmquist, the men's basketball coach, longtime friend of mine at Viola. I actually did call him last night to apologize for what's gonna happen on the court here tonight. I honestly did. I called him last night. But we're looking forward to, uh, to our game this evening. Sean and his son will be here. Uh, to enjoy the game with us, but we are um, honored and privileged to have Sean with us here this morning. So join me in a warm APU welcome, Dr. Sean McDowell. That was a fantastic introduction. And I'm going to take this jersey because I still don't have my Biola jersey. Now you've given me some leverage with Coach to be like, let's go. Hey, what a joy to be here with you. Last time I was in this gym, when I played, it was the Cougar Dome. I'm not sure why they called it a dome. But we were eighth row, center court. My son won the CIF Division III Southern Section Championship right here in this gym. So it brings back some pretty cool memories. So question for you as we start. And I think I know the answer to this. The question is, have you ever been hurt by somebody you really care about? Of course you have. My love growing up was basketball, and I know when I walked on the stage, you weren't expecting somebody about five foot nine, just for the record, which proves only one thing, there must be a God. I grew up in a little town called Julian in the mountains. There was no club basketball. There was no pickup basketball. I would break into the gym just to play and practice. And there was one man in my town who was the best basketball player. Next to my dad, he was somebody I looked up to and admired. And one day we were playing, I was a sophomore in high school, went up for a layup, he slammed me against the wall. Keep in mind, this is like early 90s, and starts cussing me out. He's 35, 6'3", I was probably 16, 5'9", 140. And I'm thinking, what is going on? cusses me out, totally mistreats me. This day, looking back, I see it a little bit differently, but I can tell you something. I went home and I sat outside and I started to cry that somebody I looked up to so deeply would treat me like that. It hurt. Well, when I got to college, I remember thinking about my life and forgiveness in a very different fashion. And I read some words that we're gonna look at this morning that rocked my world. 
Bottom line is Jesus says this, if you are a follower of mine, forgiveness is not an option. Let's dive in. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn there. If you can't find it, it's right after Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus starts off in verse 21. He says this, or it says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will I forgive my brother when he sins against me? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times, seven times. Now, Peter coming up to Jesus, what's interesting is he says, should I forgive up to seven times? I actually think that Peter believes Jesus is going to say, wow, Peter, you're so spiritual. You'll forgive seven times because the Talmud said you only have to forgive three times. So Peter's like, give me a number and then I can cross that person off my list and be finished with them. And as always, Jesus flips things on their head. He flips things on their head. In fact, in the story we're going to get to, Jesus talks about forgiving such a big debt that it's equivalent to about $400 billion, more than the GDNP of 80% of the world. In other words, continue to forgive, period, if you're a follower of mine. But then Jesus tells a story to unpack this in verse 23. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, a massive, massive debt. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and for payment to be made. Here's this king who rightfully wants people who owe him money to pay him back so he can balance his budget, comes across a servant, owes him a massive debt, demands it from him, but he can't pay it back. So the penalty is his wife and his children would be sold to help contribute to it. Have you ever had a debt you couldn't pay back? When I was 16, I was in high school, I was in Julian, if you've ever been to Julian, that's actually where I grew up, small town in the mountains of San Diego. And I was driving this Volvo Jetta, and my girlfriend, who's actually my wife now, was with me. And we were parking on this hill, parked down like this, and it was a stick shift. So somebody parked right in front of me. And in this Jetta, when I came back, the way it was designed, I have no idea why. If you go over and up, it's first. If you go over, down and up, it's reverse. So I had to shift this thing fast. So I went over and up and I forgot to go down. I hit the gas and I launched into the car in front of me. The front caught on the hitch and literally the tires were pulled up in the air because the, the suspension pulled this car up. Now my dad taught me to leave a note when this happened. We got the car down and the lady calls up and I don't remember how much. She's like, you owe me $700. And I had this feeling of dread of like a debt I simply had no way to pay back at that time. I'm still a college professor, not sure I could pay that back, but I digress. I remember this sinking feeling of owing somebody something, and I'm incapable of paying it back. Now, what's interesting about this story is Peter asked Jesus about forgiveness, and he uses money to tell the story. So Jesus isn't just talking about money. He's talking about emotional debts that we owe to other people. I remember reading this story about Michael Jackson years ago. Now, whatever you think about Michael Jackson, hands down, he is one of the greatest performers of all time. Michael Jackson was sharing at a graduation speech. And in the middle of it, he stopped. He kind of set his notes aside. And he told a story about when he was five years old on the Jackson 5. You've heard stories about the Jackson 5. At that time, they were one of the world's most recognizable music groups. Well, Michael Jackson's father was his manager. And Michael Jackson tells a story. He's on stage about five or six years old, steps off to ask his dad a question. He goes, dad, dad. And his father stops him. He goes, Michael, I am not your father. I am your manager. Get back up on stage. Michael said, you know, to be honest with you, all I wanted was for my father to say, Michael, I love you. 
I'm proud of you. All his crazy antics, he just wanted his father to be proud of him. That's the kind of burden so many people carry around. I saw the study years ago and I kept it because it was about elderly people and they were asked if they could live their life over, what things would they do differently? Isn't that a great question? And some of the most common answers were take more walks, eat more ice cream, right? And third, they said, we would choose to forgive more people. And these people, many in nursing homes, were recounting stories all the way back in grade school. Things that people said and did to them, and they carried those burdens around their entire lives. Their entire lives. A story that hit me a number of years ago, in 2006, in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, there was a man in his 30s who walked into an Amish schoolhouse. And he lined up 10 kids, 7 to 13 years old. And this hits me hard because I have a son who's 10 who's hanging out with his dad today. 7 to 13 years old. Lined them up, shot 10 of them, and 5 of them ended up dying. Well, the larger cultural story that was so interesting is the Amish, because of their theology immediately embraced the woman and the family and immediately offered forgiveness. Our culture couldn't make sense of that because in our culture, we cancel somebody when they make a mistake. They led with forgiveness because they understood how much God had forgiven them. But his wife said something so interesting. She said, I think he was acting out something that happened to him years ago before. You've heard the phrase that many people have said, hurt people hurt people. We have a broken culture, don't we? I know there's many of you in here right now who have hurts and pain from things people have said and things people have done to you, and that can be crippling and rob your joy in life. That's in part what Jesus is talking about. Now, the story goes on. He's not finished. Verse 26, it says, So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay back everything. Can you envision this scene? Here's this servant. He's got no funds. He has no resources. The last thing he can do is fall on his knees and plead to the king to forgive him. That's all he has left, is to appeal to the mercy of this king. Verse 27 says, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. And let me ask you a question before we go any further. If you were released a debt that big, how should you respond? I think we know the answer to that, don't we? But what happens? Verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. In other words, pocket change. He's forgiven this huge amount that might be millions or billions today, depending on how you calculate it. And he goes out, finds this other servant who owes him pocket change. It says, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him and said, have patience with me and I will pay you. You understand what's happening, right? Here's this servant who owed the king a debt. He couldn't pay it back. Falls on his knees, pleads to the king for mercy. He's forgiven it. And then he goes out to a fellow servant who owes him pocket change and does the same thing. And that servant responds in the same fashion, pleading with him. But where this story turns is the way the first servant responds. Verse 30, it says, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went out and reported to their master all that had taken place. 
Verse 32, then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have also had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And then this last verse, I got to tell you, rocked me. Jesus is serious about forgiveness. Jesus said, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I mean, just let that sink in. Let that sink in. Jesus is basically saying, if there's someone you need to forgive, go do it now. That's why in other passages, Jesus says, if there's someone on the way to the altar to go do something spiritual and great, don't do it. Go forgive first. You see what happens sometimes when we have hurt, we feel like if I don't seek forgiveness, but I do enough good things, I can cover it up and justify what was done wrong to me in the eyes or what I've done wrong to somebody else. And time never makes that burden just disappear and go away. It doesn't. You see, this story is really about two types of forgiveness. There's a vertical forgiveness with God. And there's a historical, for, I'm sorry, there's a horizontal forgiveness with others. The purpose of this story is, if we don't understand how much God has forgiven us, we are not going to have the grace and mercy to forgive others around us. That's why I think, as a Christian community sometimes, we don't have enough grace and kindness for other communities because the grace of God has not permeated our hearts and transformed us so we lead with jud judgment rather than with grace. It might be helpful to talk about what forgiveness is not. I think there's a lot of confusion about forgiveness, isn't there? First off, realize forgiveness is not a feeling. If you're sitting there going, Sean, yeah, I can think of someone I need to forgive, but I don't feel like it. My answer in part is welcome to the club. If you live your life based on just what you feel, you're going to wreck your life. Forgiveness is a choice. Jesus said, where your treasure is, then your heart will be after. The way it works is out of obedience when we choose to forgive, then the joy of the Lord comes. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's also not forgetting. The Old Testament, it, God says, I will remember your sins no more. It doesn't mean God has amnesia. It means God will not hold that sin against us anymore. In fact, if we forgot what happened, we might forget the lesson that we learned from it. Forgiveness is also not excusing. You ever said to somebody, hey, I'm really sorry what I did, and they're like, ah, oh, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. That's not forgiveness. That's excusing. And forgiveness is also not just a one-time choice. I wish it were. Maybe some of you are more spiritual than me, but I find myself having to go back and go back over and over again, make a choice to forgive people. So what is forgiveness? What is it? I mean, think about it. Forgiveness involves one, speaking the truth. What you did or what you said was wrong. Or what I did or what I said to you was wrong. Forgiveness starts with truth. Second, it's Bearing the wrong that, you, that has been done to you yourself. So sometimes people say, why can't God just forgive? Look, think about it. If you come over to my house and you break a lamp and you owe me $50, if I forgive you, what does that mean? It means you don't have to pay me back, but who bears the burden? I do. That's what it means to forgive. I say, hey, you broke that? I'm out $50, but I relieve you of that debt. I will bear that burden myself. When somebody harms us, says something wrong, it does something wrong. That wrongness doesn't disappear, but you say, you know what? I'm going to give you the gift of not holding this 
against you. So number one, tell the truth. Number two, bear the wrong that was done. And number three, aim to restore the relationship if possible. Sometimes people say, well, forgiveness is cheap because then the person can go out and abuse others. There's nothing unbiblical about saying, I forgive you, but you still need to pay the price, so to speak, for what you did was wrong. And there's a time to forgive somebody, but not be in relationship with that person because it just might not be healthy. But the biblical model, if possible, is tell the truth, bear the wrong, and then be restored in relationship with that person. I think one of the hardest types of experience to forgive is the things that we've done ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to forgive other people, but to allow ourselves to experience forgiveness. In my classroom, I do teach at Biola full-time, but I still teach a high school class. And I tell my students, I'm like, we can talk about anything. We're just going to bring it back to Scripture and be respectful how we do it. And I remember the topic in class shifted to pornography, and I had a student who was bothered by this. And he came up to me after the break, and he goes, hey, after class, hey, Dr. McDowell, can we talk? I was like, no, it's my lunch break. No, I didn't say that. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I said, of course, we sat down and this stud athlete, great student, great Christian family started crying. He goes, I don't know what to do. He goes, for months, I go into my room at night, turn my light off. My parents think I'm going to sleep and I just look at porn. He goes, I don't know what to do about it. And I looked at him, I said, first off, you're doing the right thing by telling me. I said, that's step number one. I said, step number two is to know that God forgives you. There was so much shame in his mind. There's probably some of you in a range of issues that just feel like if somebody knew what I have done, they'd have a hard time believing I could be forgiven. Can I tell you, if that's how you feel, my heart goes out to you because that is not true. Satan is the accuser. Jesus separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. You know why it doesn't say north from south in the Old Testament? Because if you go north, eventually you're going south. But if you go east, you're eternally going east. You know, you mentioned President Morris, the book that my father wrote, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I had a chance to update it with him. And my dad had about as rough of a background as you can imagine. He was sexually abused for seven years. His older sister took her own life. My dad's dad, my grandpa, was the town drunk. And what's amazing is my dad got to see my grandfather come to Christ right before his eyes. Because after my dad became a believer, he tried to disprove Christianity and was amazed by actually the positive evidence for it ended up becoming a Christian. And over months, God slowly changed my dad's heart. And he went to his father one time, who was not a believer. And he said, Dad, I love you. And it broke my grandpa. And to make a long story short, he saw my grandfather's life transformed right in front of him. And he actually never had another sip of alcohol for the rest of his life. My dad even offered forgiveness to the man who sexually abused him. Now, I understand that is a loaded, deep, difficult topic. I get that. But my dad is 83 years old. And I asked him recently, I said, Dad, how do you deal with aging, right? The older you get, like, Death comes near and you think about it. He said, son, one thing that gives me joy is I'm able to forgive people who have wronged me. I don't carry that guilt. I don't carry those burdens. And I'm able to live in the joy of the Lord. That's what I want. And that's what God wants for you. When I was a sophomore at Biola, this passage hit me and I thought, man, Jesus is really serious about forgiveness. So I sat down and I hand wrote a three to four page letter to this coach saying all the ways he had positively influenced me, 
the ways I was grateful in his life, but saying, you know what? The way you treated me was wrong, but I want you to know something. I forgive you. And I mailed it and I heard nothing back. Probably a few years later, I saw him maybe three or four years later. I was like, hey, did you get that letter? He goes, yeah, thanks. And I was like, really? Then <laughs> about three years later, it was strange. I saw him and all of a sudden God changed my heart. And I thought, you know what? I truly forgive him and want the best for him, even though he wronged me in a pretty deep way. Friends, here's my question for you. Do you have someone you need to forgive? Do you have someone you need to forgive? Or do you have someone you need to ask for forgiveness? If all of us would take a step back and just realize how much God has forgiven us, I think we couldn't but understand that it's pocket change to forgive others for what they've done to us. That's why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Here's the bottom line, what Jesus would say. If you realize you haven't forgiven someone, don't go to class. Sorry, president. (laughs) Don't go to another chapel. Don't go to youth group. Pick up your phone and call that person and forgive them and make it right. And you'll be free of that burden and begin to experience the joy of the Lord. Amen. Father, thank you for these students. Thank you for just their attentiveness and for the amazing things you were doing through this university. I am grateful for APU and what you are doing through the administration and the faculty and the students. And I pray if there's hurts here right now that you just give people the wisdom and the strength to go experience the forgiveness and freedom that you have for them. And we praise in your name. Amen. God bless. Thank you.